Okay, so I'm going to try this again. Um, I truly did do this video earlier today. It took me an, about an hour, so this video should last about an hour for you to watch. Um, it took <laughs> me about 30 minutes to figure out how to convert it into something I could share with you because the file was too big. And then it took me two hours for it to switch into an MP4 status. And then I never could figure out how to share it with you from there. So I'm just starting over with a new system. And um, it's okay if you pray that this works, because that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's been a long day of trying to figure this out. But we are going to talk about the physiological adaptations to pregnancy. There we go. See the cute baby. Where do babies come from? This is an interesting uh, history that I was able to find in a very unique book that I have, and it's the cultural differences um, that I was able to find. So I'm just going to read a few to you because they were very interesting. Among the Malay people, they see the man as the higher rational being, and the baby is believed to begin life in the father's brain. There the fetus develops for 40 days before sinking down into the father's penis to be ejected into the mother's dark and earthy womb during intercourse. That's one belief. Another one is that the matriarchal, matri I can't say the word, matriarchal society of West Africa believed that babies were made entirely of their mother's menstrual blood. We don't need you guys at all. We just need to bleed, I guess. The people of Madagascar believe that it's a girl's first intercourse that sets off her cycle of childbearing but that after that first time, she has no longer needs a man to help her bear children. So one time, then I guess we're like, what is it? The praying mantis? You're done. Some South African tribes women believe that if they lie down in a shower of rain, their seeds will germinate. So uh, just in case, I don't go out when it rains. <laughs> I certainly don't lay down out there. South Pacific, you're South Pacific Islanders believe that sexual intercourse prepared a woman's body for conception. And it was then while bathing in the ocean that she conceived from the sacred seaweed found floating in the water. Okay, there's another belief. These are other beliefs. I'm not going to read all these to you, but just, just a couple slides to give you a chuckle on the different, really the different uh, beliefs of these different countries and whether it's a boy or a girl. And I mean, just example, maybe it sits low in the belly, maybe it sits high in the belly. I guess the difference is whether you're Himalayan or Bedouin, Bedouin tribes, okay, or ancient Egypt. I don't know. If you're grumpy, if you're grumpy with women, if you're grumpy with men. Okay, I understand this one. <laughs> when you're pregnant, you're a little grumpier with men. But these are just kind of interesting cultural things that, uh, that I have found. Um, and here's more. And then uh, again, some more. You, you could just read through these. They're just kind of funny. Um, and I do want to let you know that um, I changed the slides from what the your resource provided to ones I had created in uh, years past. Because the information is still pertinent, it's still very pertinent. Uh, the difference is that these, I think they make it more understandable. So that's what I went with, something that helped made me made it more sensible to me to teach, which I think makes it more sensible for you to learn from. So that's why I changed the slide. I apologize that I didn't realize that earlier, but at least I realized it. These are the hormone levels. This is up to day 28. Um, so as you can see, these hormones that do their elevation, your progesterone is going here to just kind of peak out and then it kind of settles back down. Um, basal body temperature, when you know when it peaks, that's when you're ovulating. So that's when you know men need to run home and have intercourse if you're trying to get pregnant. Although I don't know about that 
eggs good for 24 hours, so I don't know why you can't wait till dinner time. But hey, that's their choice. Uh, but anyway, just some interesting hormones on what it's like to get pregnant. How the uterus every month is trying to accommodate a pregnancy is really the truth. Uh, because it goes through these cycles, and if no pregnancy ensues, then you bleed. So that's what that's all about. Uh, the uterus, oh, I've got things up above me that you can't see, I guess. That's kind of in my way. I don't know what else to do about it. Okay, reproduct. the uterus grows. In pre-pregnancy, it's about a 10 milliliter capacity. So think of the syringes of saline you see in the sim lab or at the hospital. Those are 20 milliliters. About half of that is how big the uterus is. The end of pregnancy, it's reaching 5,000 milliliters capacity, which is, gee, what is it? The four, four of the liters of fluid, milliliter, I guess it'd be five of those liters of fluid now that I think about it. So yeah, five liters of fluid. And it weighs about two and a half pounds then, just the uterus itself. The pattern of growth of the baby is very, very predictable. So that is really helpful to those of us who monitor pregnancies. Uh, because we know what to expect. And if a woman's growth pattern, the growth what we're, that I'm referring to is that of the fundal height. If the growth pattern of the fundal height is not adhering to that predictable status, then we know we got to do investigation. Okay. As we mentioned last week, I believe we mentioned the uterus is not able to be palpable until 12 weeks when it rises above the pubic bone. Okay, so here's kind of that 12-week mark right there, uh, right there. So you cannot hear through that pubic bone. You cannot see via ultrasound through that pubic bone. Uh, it's just there, okay? Once it starts going above the pubic bone, we can start hearing heart tones. Um, this is about 14 weeks here. Do you see how it's a little bit above? So you can start hearing heart tones and you can actually put a little ultrasound scope there and see. The best way to do ultrasound on these early pregnancies though is intravaginally to look from that angle. Okay? 20 weeks at the umbilicus. Remember this. Memorize this. The uterus at 20 weeks is going to be at the woman's umbilicus. I do not care if she is four foot tall or seven foot tall, that uterus is going to be at the umbilicus at 20 weeks. Okay. And you're going to be able to feel that with your hand. If you were to come upon an accident that happened on the side of the road, there's a woman laying there ah, and she's, you know, pregnant and you were to run up there to do an assessment. If you put your hand on and you feel that fundal height at 20 weeks, you can, or at the umbilicus, you can tell her, ma'am, I can tell you're 20 weeks pregnant and she will think you are the smartest thing on the road and she'll very, feel very comfortable with you taking care of her because you understand that. That is very, very predictable. Fundal height is measured from the pubic bone, the center of the pubic bone, about right here, up to the fundus. Okay, see how it goes up? For every week a woman is pregnant, that uterus will measure one centimeter more in height. So when a woman is 20 weeks pregnant, what do you think that uterine measurement is going to be? 20 centimeters. Now remember, we're talking centimeters, not inches. Look at your measuring tape. <laughs> so 20 weeks, they should measure 20 centimeters. At 24 weeks, they should measure 24 centimeters, etc. Once you get to 36 weeks, that doesn't quite, I mean, it will hold true about 36, but then after that, there are some variables that enter in, such as is the baby sitting down in the pelvis better? so that the uterus is a little bit lower, et cetera. So from 36 to 40 weeks, it should be impinging a bit on the xiphoid process up there. But even at that, um, the measurement's not as useful in that last month of pregnancy. But until then, I'll tell you what, if you, she's measuring 28 weeks, she should be about 28, I'm sorry. If she's measuring about 28 centimeters, she should be about 28 weeks. If her height of her uterus is different by two centimeters or more than what you expect, we need to do further investigation. Okay, and I think the next slide will show that. Yes, this is um, a male nurse midwife and the tape measure goes from the pubic bone up to the fundus. 
and he's probably getting a 35 or 36 centimeters there because here's our 20 and I all my experience are about a halfway up there's about 30 I don't know 34 I'm just guessing but the point is he's measuring from the pubic bone to the fundus and whatever measurement he gets should be equivalent within two centimeters or within two weeks whichever way you want to look at it of what her gestation is so at 12 weeks just remember their pregnancy that fundus should be starting to come up above the uh, pubic bone 20 weeks it should be at the umbilicus and if you were to measure that it's this is going to be about 20 centimeters right there at 40 weeks it's going to be all the way up to the xiphoid with that variable of it the baby may have settled lower so uh, you know that's not as predictable so 28 weeks what should she measure 28 centimeters if she measures 29 am I worried no because that's within the two week or two centimeter difference but if she's 28 weeks and she's only measuring 24 centimeters am I worried absolutely I want to see why that baby is not growing as well as I expect could it be the baby has is on a short short growth curve where nutrition is a problem or are we wrong on her due date that also could be the problem. We need to make sure that we have an accurate due date. If she's 28 weeks and measuring 32, my goodness, maybe she has twins. Or maybe she has polyhydramnios. That's why we have to investigate further. Contractility of the uterus. Um, prior to labor, there are things called Braxton Hicks contractions. That's what belongs in these. I, I discovered, I will, t I will admit, I discovered this little writing pen and I'm having fun with it. Because <laughs> it's Friday night and I'm here teaching a class at 11 o'clock at night. So let me play with my pen. <laughs> Anyway, Braxton Hicks contractions are painless. They're irregular. I generally told my patients if they were walking around getting them to lay down, take a warm bath, relax. If they go away, that's all they were. If they were relaxing and laying down and they got those Braxton Hicks, I told them to get up and walk around. In other words, change your activity. If they continue to keep coming, it could be labor. If too early, it could be preterm labor. If they go away with the change of activity, they were just Braxton Hicks. Bottom line, Braxton Hicks are not easy to diagnose over a telephone, and it generally takes a couple hours of the patient doing other things to see if they're still coming or getting worse. They do get worse in the third trimester. Also, they get worse with each pregnancy. So a patient having her first pregnancy will not likely have too many of them patient having her third or fourth baby oh boy those braxton hicks can get really bad the uterine blood flow is significantly increased increased due to the growth of that uterus the uterus has to grow to accommodate the baby and it also has to maintain that placenta the placenta is a very bloody organ and so it takes a lot of blood so a lot of the maternal blood flow will go to support those two structures the blood flow to the placenta actually is about 450 to 650. I think another slide says 500 milliliters per minute on average, but you can see it goes, it's going through there pretty quick. And of course, the purpose of that blood equals oxygen, right? That's the purpose. Um, this is a picture of the cervix. Uh, the cervix is the lower segment of the uterus. If you think of the uterus like a balloon, that's a really bad balloon. There we go, better balloon. Forget the middle line. So you've got the uterus um, with this cervix here, and the cervix is what's going to open and become completely dilated so that that whole space is open for a baby to come through, which is 10 centimeters. While the woman is pregnant, the uh, estrogen, you remember that the hormone estrogen is working on the whole body. And it's also, of course, working on that cervix and it causes the cervix to turn kind of purplish blue. Remember the, well, we haven't, I don't think we talked about that yet. The increase in blood flow to the mom during pregnancy is about 50% more blood than normal, than her normal blood flow is. So all that extra blood goes throughout the body. And of course it goes to that cervix as well. And that's what gives it the blue color. That is called Chadwick's sign. It's a blue cervix. 
The other sign that we will see in early pregnancy and onward is Goodall's sign, which is where the cervix gets softer. In a non-pregnant cervix, that cervix feels like the, go ahead right now and touch the tip of your elbow or your knee. Even you guys have a kneecap. That's how firm the cervix is that is not a pregnant one. Once a woman is pregnant, that cervix will soften a bit and it will feel more like your nose. Okay, touch your nose. That's how much it softens. Pretty amazing, really. So that is what uh, the effect of estrogen will do. So you see in this slide, this is uh, non-pregnant and it's just, you know, it's just there. This is the vaginal canal. This is the surface. When we get our pap smears, this is where they're getting it from. That's what causes ouchy pinchy, ouchy pinchy is right there. That's as far as all that stuff's going. This side, you see how it's, it's a little more relaxed. And then this part here is the cervical canal and you see it's kind of funneled in there. And this is a mucus, all that kind of clear white there is the mucus plug and what that does is it blocks bacteria it blocks the ability of black bacteria to enter into that sterile environment known as the uterus um, that allows a woman to safely have intercourse to you know of course we don't want to put a whole bunch of stuff up in there but bottom line this vi vagina is not a sterile environment so what protects that fetus up in there is this mucus plug it keeps bacteria from migrating upward all right this is another change that you'll notice in a pregnant woman and it's the breasts they become bigger more vascular the areola become darker due to the estrogen component estrogen causes an increase in melanin deposits melanin is the hormone of darkened skin um, so you'll see the, the areola get darker during a pregnancy. They may or may not have colostrum. That's the precursor to milk. That's a little, it's, it's kind of yellowish in color. Uh, some women will have it and some will not. It's not a big deal if they don't. It's not a big deal if they do. It just is. Um, and again, these changes are caused by what? If you say estrogen, you would be correct. Do you see the non-pregnant breast? It's just there, you know, it's doing its thing. It's being a breast. And then it gets pregnant. It starts to um, increase in all the tissues in there. And then lactating, they start to fill up with milk. So that is the difference. That's why the breast gets more pendulous. And you can see the varicosities there. The vagina and vulva also increase in vascularity. And they can get quite edematous. Um, uh, is this TMI? I don't know. I know that the only thing that made me feel better with my pregnancy was was wearing one of the, which you guys don't even know about. It's an old fashioned thing. It's an elastic band around your waist and you would hook your menstrual pad on it, which came with flaps on each end and you tap it up there, which sounds really disgusting. But I'll tell you what, that thing helped my vulva feel like it was supported by something. Otherwise, it just is feels huge it's not necessarily as huge as it feels but a little goes a long way down there so that can be quite uncomfortable to a woman to have um, that increased vascularity and and now that they have pads that stick to your panties you can't even lift it up with your elastic waistband so I think you guys I was glad I had mine old-fashioned kind <laughs> Um, the other thing that happens in pregnancy is there's an increase in glycogen the the Pregnant woman will have more glycogen stores to help feed the baby, and that, of course, be, favors that candida growth. And so yeast infections are quite common in, early, in the pregnancy, not just early, but in pregnancy, so can be quite uncomfortable. The ovaries secrete progesterone for the first six to seven weeks. That's where the hormone of pregnancy comes to support the growing products of conception at that time is through ovaries. The heart <clears throat> becomes uh, a little bit larger. The muscles enlarge slightly to accommodate that increased workload. It also, because of the growing uterus, it moves up and to the left to kind of give the uterine, growing uterus room to go. So it moves up and to the left, okay? Because of the increased blood flow to the, to the mom with that 500, that 50% more blood, the murmurs can become evident that 
were never there before. I don't say become evident. Murmurs may start because of all the extra blood that heart's trying to accommodate. Um, the blood viscosity in a pregnant woman is, is um, decreased so that the blood can flow more freely and the blood flow is increased. So that combination makes them more at, not risk, but it's more likely to hear heart murmurs on pregnant women than non-pregnant women. Blood volume, there we go. The volume increases 30 to 50%. It's okay if you just think of 50%. That's what I've taught women for years and years. And uh, there's that 5,000 milliliters at 32 weeks, which is basically that's what it is at term as well. And the reason for that, that baby and the mom, all that extra tissue that mom is getting as she grows needs nutrition and oxygen. So it goes to the placenta and the fetus and the maternal tissue, okay? It also pre pre provides a reserve for blood loss of what? What is going to be a blood loss cause of a pregnant woman? She's going to deliver. Let's see if I can do this. Delivery. This is a kind of fun, maybe? Delivery. There we go. So that's going to be a reason for blood loss. So there's extra blood to, to uh, prepare for that. So you can lose some and not die. The red blood vessel, the, they increase by 250 to 400 milliliters. And so you will see an elevated elevation of the volume, volume, okay? But what you'll see on a lab work is what's called physiologic anemia. That will, because of the extra volume, but not exactly extra hemoglobin, you're gonna see a, a apparent an apparent anemia the hemoglobin will appear low the hemoglobin will be low due to that dilution you know this woman's got a lot of extra blood a lot of extra fluid and it goes into the bloodstream as well and so the blood appears to be more dilute than a non-pregnant woman so it appears that her hematocrit and hemoglobin will be decreased um, so our normal, if our normal is a 12 to 13 for hemoglobin, then a hemoglobin of 11 for a pregnant woman is actually quite sufficient. You get much lower than that, we worry about anemia, iron deficiency anemia. But all pregnant women are put on vitamins and iron, so it shouldn't become a problem unless there is a big problem. So just understand that in spite of all the extra blood, they appear to be anemic because of the hemo uh, dilution, giving a false crit. Cardi cardiac output will increase by 30 to 50 percent, and it increases by an increase in the stroke volume and an increase in the heart rate. A pregnant woman's heart rate will increase anywhere from 10 to 20 beats a minute, and it is the highest when she's lying on her side. Now think of your athletic woman, someone who's a runner, uh, well-trained, her heart rate is going to be lower than the, than the non-trained, you know, someone who's not as physically active. So, you know, if you've got a heart rate of 60 on a runner, I wouldn't worry about that. But if you've got a heart rate of 60 on a non-runner, someone who's not physically in great shape, I would be concerned about that, okay, So could, because it should elevate a little bit. The progesterone and also the relaxin hormones cause a decrease in that peripheral vascular resistance. Those vessel walls relax. So that is to help the circulation get through the body, okay? But what is it going to do to the blood pressure? If, every, if those blood vessel walls are relaxed, that blood pressure is going to, it says remain stable in spite of the increased volume, but actually it also could actually drop in the initial part, initial weeks and months of pregnancy. Someone who is a chronic hypertensive who is on blood pressure medication, she may actually need to decrease the, the uh, medication, her blood pressure dosage or go off of it for a while because of this effect on the blood pressure. As the muscle, as the blood vessels relax, blood pressure will go down. So she needs to be closely surveilled with her internist, the OB and the internist. Um, she sees both. 
to monitor that blood pressure so she's not getting hypotensive, which is quite dangerous to a baby that needs an adequate blood supply. A blood pressure of 140 over 90 requires, or greater, requires further assessment. We will talk about that when we get to high-risk pregnancy. Supine hypotension is where that uterus that's growing and getting full of baby at placenta, it occludes the vena cava and the descending aorta, which prevents blood flow from returning to the heart and, and uh, therefore impedes blood flow to the fetus. So pregnant women should not lay on their back, bottom line. You get a decreased cardiac return, decreased output, their blood pressure is going to drop, they're going to get symptomatic. So we need to teach them to re do not lay on your back. Left side's the best, right side's great, not your back. And you can see here the descending aorta and then the inferior vena cava, and you've got this pregnancy laying on that, basically occluding any of that blood flow. Whereas here, woo, it's free flow, and that's how she needs to lay. The blood flow um, goes through about 500 milliliters per minute is what's required to perfuse that placenta. 30% um, more blood must circulate through those kidneys to remove the increased metabolic waste. The baby's the fetus is contributing to that need as well, so the kidneys need to work harder. The skin requires increased circulation to get rid of the heat generated by the increased metabolism. Pregnant, it sounds crazy, but our metabolism is increased in pregnancy, even as our uh, physical output seems to decrease, but that metabolism is all happening by a growing baby, all that stuff going on. Um, the other thing that can happen of the weight of the uterus on the vessels feeding the legs is can cause varicose veins, all right, as the blood pools down in there. Now, varicose veins, we need to be evaluating them. Some can get quite severe. Some women need to use support hose because if it's bad enough, we need to help the blood flow get back up to the heart. Red blood cells are increased by 25 to 33%. The white cells increase during pregnancy as it uh, helps prevent a mom from getting infections. And then the plasma fibrinogen factor will increase by 50%. And what that does, it helps clotting at delivery. We don't want our hemorrhaging out at delivery, but what does that increase the risk of if you've got an increased clotting factor? Blood clots. Blood clots. I'm just going to use clots. Yes. So that's what the risk is. That's where we have a higher risk of um, blood clots in our legs, in our lungs, in our head. All right, we're not going to answer these questions live here, so they're live, but, but I do want to refer you to any of these slides that have a critical thinking exercise, because if you can answer these questions, then you will understand the physiological changes in pregnancy. That's what they're there for. Uh, for the respiratory system, the oxygen consumption increases by 50 to 15 to 20 percent. As we said, the fetus, placenta, uterus, cardiac demands, all those demand more oxygen. So the woman, the pregnant woman will breathe more deeply. Her rate will not change, but her breathing gets deeper and more efficient. Um, and think of as the baby grows, it's making the lungs actually a smaller space, so it they need to be more efficient or we can't get enough oxygen in us, let alone all these other things. Progesterone decreases airway resistance. Remember, a progesterone is the smooth muscle relaxer. It's vital. Estrogen causes the vascularity of the mucous membranes to increase. So when you get increased mucous membranes, uh, increased vascularity there, what else happens? Ugh, well, stuffy. And yeah, it can be quite miserable. Okay, bloody noses are common as you get extra blood in the nose, also in the gums. Uh, they're advised to use a soft toothbrush because the gums will bleed quite easily. Everything is all engorged. Uh, we're just like this big walking engorged blood thing <laughs> when we're pregnant. It's really quite unpleasant to experience, but it's a wonderful miracle that we're doing. Uh, diaphragm gets elevated, um, the lung volume will decrease, so you'll get that ribs flaring, 
Chest circumference will increase. Who does that remind you of? The COB, COPD patient. Yeah, we're, we're about that. We're about like that. Oh, it's amazing we survive it, but we do. It's a miracle. GI tract, all the GI tract gets more stuff in it. The mouth gets increased. Um, oh, saliva, a lot more mucus. Uh, that's where the gingivitis and bleeding gums comes in. The uh, excess of salivation, I can never say the word. P-T-Y-A-L-I-S-M is how it's spelled. And I think it's patialism. I've had patients with that problem and I'll tell you of all the problems in pregnancy that's the one that is hardest was hardest for me to handle because what they do bless their little hearts they walk around with a spit cup and they're constantly spitting all this extra saliva in that spit cup and it's a little bit hard for me not to gag when they're doing it and they can't help it I, you know it's just like you just have to kind of deal with it and then go to the bathroom when the patient leaves the office and go oh glad that's over poor thing though can you imagine just saliva like crazy and they can't swallow it there's so much they can't swallow it all um esophagus has reduced tone so what are they going to get because of the relaxation remember and heartburn in the stomach um all they relax all the smooth muscle they're going to have a decrease in the gi tone gets poopy so what do you think happens Oh, they can't empty the food they eat. So they get nausea. They feel full. They can eat less. They eat very little, but then they get hungry quicker. It's just really quite miserable. Large intestine has decreased mobility. So they get constipated as things just sit there. And then they can get hemorrhoids because of that constipation and straining. And all hemorrhoids are is, is uh, um, dilated vascular you know blood vessels in the rectum so that's all happening anyway so again it's a really high risk time for misery <laughs> the liver is pushed upward gallbladder becomes low energy empties takes longer so they get gallstones yeah we're slow and yet our metabolism increases i don't get it the bladder I'm sure you've heard they pee more and they have to go to the bathroom a little bit more urgent. And sometimes it can be difficult to determine what's a normal pregnancy bladder and what's a urinary tract infection bladder. So the big difference, what is it? What do you think it is? Someone who's pregnant is going to go to the bathroom more often and have to run. But when they're done, they feel done. And it also does not burn when they urinate. For someone with a UTI, they're going to be frequent and they're going to have that urgency but when they're done they don't feel done they feel like there's more left in there and they have often dysuria so that's the biggest difference so when you have someone complaining about going to the bathroom all the time we need to do further investigation on other symptoms to rule out uti kidneys we have an increased risk of kidney infection due to a compression of the ureters between the ureters and the pelvis urine just hangs around okay you've got compression so the the urine doesn't flow through and where does bacteria like to grow warm dark moist areas what is the kidney warm dark and moist so you have an increased risk of bacteriuria uh, with a pregnant woman may or may not be symptomatic the only way to diagnose that is through a urine tests urine, uh, urine analysis they also have that state of glycosuria which we're going to talk about in a second but that increases or enhances the growth of that bacteria and yeast the renal blood flow increases 35 to 60 percent and then the glomerular glomel gfr glomerular filtration rate uh, increases due to that extra volume and cardiac output just more coming through to the kidney and it's gonna increase it just kicks into a higher gear okay glycosuria as that GFR increases the filtered load of sugar will exceed the ability of the GFR to to, uh, re to um, absorb so you're gonna get spillover in the urine most likely we do not we generally do not worry about urine protein pre protein urea 
of trace or even one plus in most women. One plus, we kind of dig a little further in to make sure she's okay. But uh, of the glucose, I'm sorry, I'm saying pro proteinuria, glycosuria, we don't get too concerned about a little bit of spill, but if it's more than that, we would do early testing for diabetes. Protein urea is another thing that spills, protein spills. And again, mild or trace levels are very normal. It's just the kidney cannot process all that's being presented to it. So it'll spill into the urine. And when we do a dipstick, you'll see some protein there. If we get one plus or more protein, we would need to do further testing because our concern is that preeclampsia, which is another discussion at another day on another PowerPoint. So anyway, so remember, glycosuria, not uncommon. Proteinuria, mild. You know, the low levels is not uncommon. Just a little funny. I'm getting more exercise since I became pregnant. I walk three miles a day, back and forth to the toilet. That's pretty much what we feel like. <clears throat> the skin, uh, we have inc increased circulation there as well, and so that makes us perspire more when we're pregnant. Um, hyperpigmentation, that is an increased uptake of melanin in the skin, and so you get what's called the mask of pregnancy, a cloasma. Uh, or I guess they call it melasma. I've only heard it chalasma or mask of pregnancy. That's just basically the darkening pigmentation of certain areas that are high risk for that. Some women will get them on their forehead, cheeks, nose. There's actually some, it's called the butterfly face because the dark skin forms like a butterfly wings on the cheeks. Um, the other darkening happens on the fundus, on the abdomen, I should say. And that will, I think there's another slide that I'll be able to show you, but that's called the linea nigra. And that's just the darkening of the pigmentation on the, the um, abdomen from belly button to pubic bone. We'll show you that. Moles will become darker. As I mentioned earlier, the areola of the breast becomes darker. And it usually disappears after birth, and it can take quite a while doesn't happen immediately. Um, I used to always tell patients it took you nine months to get like this. It's going to take at least nine months to get unlike this. <laughs> so it gives them a little more realistic view of when they can feel normal again. Um, and then you get the all these vascular. Just think, all the blood vessels are dilating. That's just what you got to know. It's all because of that estrogen. Okay. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I 30, side 30. Okay, I think I'm okay. I saved the other slides. and now, Oh, I still don't have my advance. It's going on. Okay, there it is. It's just not lighting up right. Okay, there's Lucy. She had her baby. Beautiful little boy. She had two boys. Not at the same time. But she still has her little mask of pregnancy. And then here she is, he's 11 years old, mask of pregnancy is gone, she's all back to normal. It did not take 11 years to get there, but there she is, okay? Okay, then we're at the tissue. Whoa, look at these little lines. We, um, those are called, okay, I'm striagravidarum. I'm like, a, I'm kind of thrown by that video. I'm hoping I didn't screw it all up. I don't think I did. But this is striagravidarum, and that's basically the stretching of the connect of the tissue. Some women have very elastic tissue, elastic skin, and they will not get stretch marks. That's the term you heard of it. The stretch marks um, will happen with someone who does not have very elastic tissue. The skin has to stretch, so it'll just stretch and make these red marks. Someone who has elastic tissue, it just stretches nicely. I was blessed with elastic tissue. So they, they are going to come, whether they use... Uh, cocoa butter or not it's okay if they use cocoa butter they think it's helping I don't care use it it's not gonna help but let them use it they think they're doing something to prevent it they'll tell you oh it could have been a whole lot worse yeah, yes it could have been you just go along with it it's okay it doesn't matter linea negra as I mentioned that's the one that um, goes from the belly button to the pubic bone that's the dark line of pregnancy it's I just made it a V. It's not a triangle. It's just that line. That's the linea negra. And that doesn't happen until later on in pregnancy. It's not going to be an early sign. It's going to be like, I don't know, 28, 30 weeks, somewhere in there. Okay. What happens with our muscle, musculoskeletal? We get all 
all that estrogen is causing us to get loose and um, calcium storage is still maintained and the baby demands more of it so the baby's getting it I'll take it before we get it so we want to make sure we're drinking our milk and getting our calcium um, we have a, a widening of the pelvic joints and that's where you get the waddle gait you kind of lean back you've seen us walk when we're far along and we're just trying to hang in there of course our center of balance is also off so it's really it's really quite the experience in maintaining an upright position <laughs> the abdominal muscles stretch and may separate diastasis recti is a muscle and i thought i had a slide in here but i don't so i'm just going to try to draw a little bit you have your diastasis recti muscle they are verticals this is an abdomen Here's the other one, verticals. And when we're not pregnant, these are like that, okay? When we're pregnant, these will separate. And guess who pops out from here? Guess who pops out from there is the pregnancy. Comes out and stretches these way apart. And so after delivery, it's kind of fun. If you want to have fun with a postpartum patient, have her put her chin to her chest because what will happen is their uterus, which did not deliver, it's still in there. Their uterus will pop out like a teepee, a tent between, you know, in between these. Because these are way apart. They're more like this now. Like that. Don't you like my sound effects? It's Friday night. I get to use sound effects. And so you tell them to put their chin to their chest, which their head's up here. And this, the tummy, the tummy, the uterus will pop out from this area and be a big V popping up. It's really quite entertaining, but that will go back together to perform, pro provide kind of that girdle effect for abdominal muscle. It just never goes back completely. So that's the diastasis recti muscle. You can see how that, see if that muscle didn't go apart. There's one muscle here and the di other one's way over there. You can't see it because of course it's, it's an outside view of her. But um, that diastasis recti muscle had to separate in order to accommodate this baby flying out of this diastasis had to come from there, right? So the baby could come out. But these are that just shows you how they have to do that. The pituitary gland um, secretes more, pro it starts to seek secrete prolactin so that the breast can be prepared to produce milk that's the milk hormone oxytocin is also produced uh, it is the one that stimulates contractions and ideally it stimulates them at labor to get us into labor and deliver the baby uh, if our bodies are not producing the oxytocin generally it's because it's not time for us to deliver yet but if there's a medical reason that we need to be induced then the induction is done with fake oxytocin, which is called pitocin. We'll talk about that later. Um, but basically oxytocin is the hormone of um, labor and it also does help uh, afterwards, which is really important. After delivery, it also contracts the uterus to prevent hemorrhage. So the uterus can get all tight and firm, as firm as it's gonna be, clamped down on the blood vessels so that the woman does not hemorrhage. So oxytocin is used to get the baby out, then it's used to keep from bleeding too much. And it also stimulates that milk ejection reflex after birth. So thyroid gland is involved. It gets bigger. The BMR increases by about 25% due to that metabolic activity of the fetus, not the mama. Mamas are slowed down inside. The pancreas, this is that interesting part about glucose. The first trimester, there's an increase in the glucose demand by that little fetus. So the mom's maternal serum glucose will go down. So her pancreas does not have that same amount of glucose uh, stimulus to create insulin. So the insulin production goes down. Second trimester, things kick in where the uh, hormones cause a tissue sensitivity to insulin gets even re reduced. And so you have a reflex of in increase in maternal glucose which is to that pancreas and causes more insulin production, okay? That is the time in pregnancy when they are at the highest risk for gestational diabetes. If in that second trimester, they have not increased, um, if their, their pancreas can't keep up with that increase in glucose, 
they're what's known as gestational diabetics. So the time that we test women for gestational diabetes is about 26 weeks, second trimester. That is in another PowerPoint as well, just referring now. HCG is the one that gives us that positive pregnancy test. It's produced by those very, very early trophoblastic cells that are around the embryo, and it supports that corpus luteum, which is the heart-giving hormones until the placenta can take over, okay? And that's the one I think I mentioned last week that if a woman is at risk of losing an early pregnancy, we do HCG level, and then we repeat it in 70, 20, 48 to 72 hours, and it should double. So that's the one that level will go like that, and then it goes down, and then it stays down because it's not needed after the placenta takes over. Um, estrogen is produced primarily by that corpus luteum in the first six to seven weeks. And at 12 weeks, the placenta takes over that job. Okay, That's what helps the uterus grow. It increases the blood supply. It helps develop those ducts, D-U-C-T, development in preparation in the breast for lactation. And it's what just all that other stuff we talked about. Estrogen, hormone of pregnancy. Uh, progesterone maintains the endometrial layer for implantation. If we didn't have progesterone, our uterus could never accept the fertilized ovum. It would just fall out. So it maintains that level, gives it the, not the strength, it just provides the right hormonal environment for, to hang around. It is also the one <clears throat> that does smooth muscle relaxation and causes all those effects. Um, it has plays a role in the prep, preparing the breast for lactation and it helps us deposit the maternal fat stores, which sounds like we don't need it, but we do. We need that energy for pregnancy and lactation. We need a lot more than what we normally have. Relaxin is that hormone of relaxation. It's produced by that corpus luteum and then the placenta and it helps everything stay soft, separate out soft, Okay, we've talked about that. Human placental lactogen, it supports the nutrition and growth of the fetus, promotes the breast tissue development, and decreases that insulin sensitivity and glucose use, which makes more glucose available for fetal nutrition. Because of the change in metabolism, the mom's going to have weight gain. She's going to get that dependent edema. We remember we talked about the hemodilution. We talked about how the compression of the, well, not the compression, we didn't talk about this, but the veins get compressed by the gravid uterus, which delays venous return. And so the blood basically hangs around in the feet and the legs. So when you've got blood pooling down there, what you have is edema, not blood so much as the, the uh, water coming out of the, because of the colloid osmotic pressure coming out and causing edema. So edema of the feet and ankles is very, 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 very normal. What is not normal is edema of the face or hands because those are not dependent. There's some other reason and it's gonna to have to do with the um, pregnancy induced hypertension. We will talk about that later. Carpal tunnel, oh, especially with all the computer use and cell phones and typing with our thumbs or whatever. Fluid retention occurs everywhere in the body, everywhere. And so when it occurs in the hands, you get compression of that medial nerve and they get carpal tunnel. And um, what they need is what I would always encourage them would be to get the wrist supports from the pharmacy and wear them at night while they're sleeping so that during those hours anyway, the um, blood flow can be unimpeded and the fluid will be reabsorbed a little bit, gives them the help. It's, it's a tough situation. Another critical thinking exercise that, that you need to work through on your own. I'm not gonna go through the detail on this one, but this will help you understand, know whether or not you understand what we just talked about. So I encourage you to go to slide 40 and work through that. Uh, the fetal diet, ma maternal diet to fetal health. The recommended weight gain for a normal pre-pregnant weight, say you're just normal as can be, 25 to 35 pounds. Now, when my mom got pregnant, they didn't, they couldn't go past 20 pounds, even if you're a normal weight. 20 pounds was the max, so it's kind of we really changed that, 25 to 35. If a woman starts out underweight, 
then she can gain a little more. We actually like to see them gain 28 to 40 pounds because if they're underweight, they need nutrition in addition to giving their baby nutrition. If one is overweight with a BMI between 26 and 29, then we would advise them more to the 15 to 25, excuse me, 15 to 25 pound weight gain, which um, is still sufficient, but not so much that they're going to gain weight when they're pregnant. And the severely obese, those who are over 29, 15 pounds would be definitely enough for them. And I will tell you, I've had in my career a few, well, several severely obese patients. And uh, we, I did a lot of nutritional counseling with them and talking with them. And when they maintain their nutritional intake as advised, they often would lose weight. Okay, so instead of gaining 15 pounds, they might lose 10 over the course of a pregnancy. The way that you would monitor those kind of patients would be to do urine, well, we do urine tests anyway, but we check for those ketones. If, if these women were not throwing ketones in their urine, then I knew that they were getting adequate nutrition, okay? They were living off the food. They were not living off ketones, which is the breakdown of their own fat cells. So as long as your ketones are negative, someone who's severely obese can actually lose weight and still have a very healthy pregnancy and a very healthy baby. Twin pregnancies, you get a little bit of grace, but it is not double. It's not 50 to 70, it's 35 to 45. Um, shorter women, now this, this is just the way it is when you're under 5'2", five, 5' five foot or under, um, you're, the pelvis is a little less wide. And so it's harder for someone who's shorter to deliver a eight pound baby. So in order to try to avoid the eight pound range, we try to keep their weight gain to more of the 15 to 25 pounds so that they have a better chance of a vaginal delivery. The exception to this rule is the Hispanic women. As you know, in work, living out your life, you've seen Hispanic women and, and they are often just short. That's just their short stature. But I'll tell you what, those women have a pelvis that can deliver a 10 pound baby without batting an eye. So um, Hispanic women are the exception to that rule. They, they're they really an amazing um, group of people. And I adored working with them, but I didn't trust them as far as delivering because they don't tell you. They just do it and you're, they're looking at you and you're, you have to really be good at reading their face and saying, are you pushing? If you're pushing, you got to stop. But they can deliver big babies, but mm, that's about the only culture that can, I would think. Adolescents need to have a little bit better nutrition because often they have had, they're starting out with poor nutrition. So we would advise them to go maybe the 28 to 40. Of course, they don't want to gain that much because they're adolescents. Um, and this is not evenly spaced throughout the, the uh, 40 weeks. Um, the first trimester, which is up to 12 weeks, they're only going to gain about three and a half, maybe five pounds total. And that's because of often pregnant women are nauseated, they're vomiting, they just don't feel like eating. So they're going to lose weight or only gain very little. It's not a big deal. But then what happens, they start feeling better, they eat better, they start gaining a pound a week, which is advised. What I often would see between um, the 18th and 22nd week, they would gain 10 pounds and freak out because they think they're going to do that every month. But really, they're just catching up with this being behind here. Not at all unusual. So it's not evenly spaced, but overall, it's about a pound a week at the end. Okay, this is another bit of cultural. In Jamaica, women know they're pregnant by looking for signs in their dreams. They would dream of ripe fruit and shoals of, whatever a shoal is, shoals of fish meant they were pregnant. In ancient Egypt, a potion of watermelon mixed with milk from another woman who had given birth to a boy was drunk or injected into her vulva. If the woman threw up, she was pregnant. Oh, Lord, seriously? The idea makes me want to throw up. Women in the Philippines look for darkening skin in their armpits, in the backs of the knees, elbows, sometimes on the belly, groin, and thighs. That actually kind of makes sense, right? Darkening skin. Tribal women in India report a sensation of smelling something fishy, which makes them throw up. So what do all these symptoms have in common? 
they have in common the estrogen effects of pregnancy, right? The smelling, the off odor, wanting to throw up, they don't feel good, darkening skin, all of it, estrogen. It's interesting. All right, now we're going to go into the different indications of pregnancy. There's presumptive, probable, and positive, and we're going to differentiate between all of those. Um, the presumptive indications of pregnancy are those that are subjective, changes the woman experiences or reports, that's what she tells you, or changes that can be caused by something else. So amenorrhea, is pregnancy the only thing that can cause someone not to have a period? No. So not having a period could be, but it might not be. Now, in a woman who is very, very regular, I would be more suspect that she's pregnant if she had amenorrhea, but some women are very irregular and it wouldn't give me pause at all to go, I don't know if you're pregnant or not. Nausea and vomiting, of course, that's an early sign, but that's a sign of a lot of things. Fatigue, yes, that's a sign of pregnancy, but also a sign of many other things. That urinary frequency could be, but then she might have a UTI, we don't know. Breast and skin changes, okay, especially one thing I noticed, especially with pregnant women, is early, early, one of the earliest signs was breast tenderness, okay? That is, mm, I'm, it's still presumptive, don't get me wrong, it's presumptive, but press, breast tenderness puts it higher on my list of probable, okay? But because it's something that's reported, it's still presumptive. Vaginal and cervical color changes, that of course the woman cannot see, but that fits under that can be caused by something else. So other things can cause those changes, other hormonal conditions. So that does not indicate definite sign of pregnancy. It's just presumptive. Quickening is when you start feeling that little baby move, when the mom feels baby move between 16 and 20 weeks. But it's still considered presumptive because what else could it be? And if I were to tell you that those first little flutters of the baby uh, reminded me of gas, little gas bubbles. You know, what else could it be? Could be gas. So quickening is not in and of itself because it's not a solid kick. It's just a whoops, what was that? Presumptive. Then we get into probable signs. Um, these are objective indications that can be documented by an examiner, by you, by the provider. They primarily are related to physical changes and they may be caused by other conditions other than pregnancy. So we have, it'll rise the, uh, increase the, I, I thought that she's pregnant, but it's not definitely diagnostic. If the abdomen's getting larger and they've had no period, yeah, she's probably pregnant, right? Probably, probably. So abdominal enlargement is probably a sign but there are other things that can cause that. Tumors, right? Um, a lot of different things. Cervical softening, it's that Chadwick sign. That can be uh, like, okay, is she pregnant or is there another hormonal effect going on? Okay. Changes in the uterus, velotment. And we're, there's, the next slide talks about velotment, but if you were to think of, let me just try to draw this uterus again. You got a uterus. Pew. Here's the cervix. You've got something in there. Let's just pretend it's a tennis ball for the sake of just explaining. So whatever this is down here in the uterus, if the examiner puts their finger up, this looks like a big space, but it really isn't. You can feel whatever's here quite easily. If they put their finger up there and hit that, that will boink, go up to here and then it'll slide back down into place. That's called belotment, where it goes up and then down. So tumors don't necessarily move like that. So it's not likely to be a tumor, but we still don't know. It's still probable. Braxton Hicks, maybe. I mean, I don't know what else makes this contract, but that's pretty nonspecific. All right, then we've got a patient here. We're, she's on our table and we're palpating the abdomen. And I think I feel the outline of a fetus there. Yes, that could be a fetus, but it also could be a really big tumor. So uterine souffle that is where you put the doppler on the abdomen trying to get heart tones and what you hear is the mom's pulse rate through the placenta and it sounds like whoosh, 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 whoosh. it's the same rate as her pulse and it has that whoosh sound to it 
probably pregnant. Not a whole lot of other stuff can cause that. Pregnancy tests, you might want to say they're diagnostic, but they're not. It's a high probability, but, they're, but an increased HCG can be caused by other conditions, big one being molar pregnancy or a tumor, a estrogen-fed tumor. Don't let the word molar pregnancy fool you. Molar means it's not a baby. It's just a mass of cells pretending to be a pregnancy. That will be covered a little bit in uh, high risk. And here's that velotment. You see the finger here, the cervix. It looks like a big space. It really isn't. But you push there, and the baby pops up, then it slides back down. That's it. Positive. You're definitely pregnant. Yes, you can go home and tell your family you're definitely pregnant. That's objective data that only a fetus can cause, whether it's felt, seen, or heard. I hear heart sounds. Woohoo! They're audible by about 10 weeks with the Doppler, but as you, if you remember, it's not that uterus is not above the pubic bone until about 12 weeks. So, you know, it would be hard to hear it at 10 weeks just because of that, unless you can get a good angle. But they would be audible if, if you could get the right angle. The normal heart rate of a fetal heart rate is 110 to 160. So that's something to put into your brain. Burn it into your brain, 110 to 160. You also, you want to auscultate, although I would palpate mom's pulse. I would do a radio pulse at the same time I'm listening to the heart, baby's heartbeat because I can't listen to two things at once. So I would palpate and then listen. But other ways, make sure it's not the mom because some maternal pulses can be as high as 110, right? That can happen. Now, if it's 160, I would doubt it. But anyway, fetal movements that you feel. You've got your hands on her abdomen and all of a sudden, this something bangs you, kicks you, strong kick. You're like, oh, I felt something move. Tumors do not move like that. So that's a positive indication. And then, goodness, just seeing it under ultrasound, absolutely that's positive. I see the baby. We are going to talk a bit about assessment, uh, antepartum assessment when they come into the office and care. Um, a lot of this is just, I'm just going to kind of fly through because we've talked in detail about the system changes. So all those systems that we just discussed need to be evaluated. Of course, the provider will do most of this physical, but you need to know what it is that they're doing. And now you know why they're doing it, what they're looking for. Your job as a nurse is to get the history. What is their OB history? How many children do they have? Did they have any problems delivering any of the other babies? How big were the previous children? So were any of them preterm? Um, was she post dates after 42 weeks on any of them or after 40 weeks? Menstrual history, are your periods regular? Do you skip periods? Is that common? What contraceptive do you use? When's the last time you used it? This the general medical and surgical history. How about your family? Are there any problems in the family and genetic concerns? And then psychosocial, are you married? Are you planning to keep the baby, et cetera? What is your support system at home, et cetera, et cetera? Lab data, we're going to just briefly look at momentarily. And then that risk assessment, which, one, which patients are at risk for developing the diabetes? Which ones are at risk for developing the hypertension? It's up to us as nurses to get our... Uh, detective ears on and, and evaluate for that. The obstetric history would consider consist of, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but the gravita, the parity, how many abortions. Please know abortions includes miscarriages. In front of the patient, I never say the word abortion. Medically, every pregnancy loss before 20 weeks is an abortion, medically termed. If a woman has lost a pregnancy before 20 weeks, I'm not going to use that word abortion. I'm going to call it a miscarriage. Obviously, that term abortion has very, very strong uh, emotional feelings to it. So if, she, if you know she's had an abortion, that's one thing. But when they've miscarried, do not use that term. Medically, an abortion is any pregnancy lost before 20 weeks. Okay. And then how many living children? We will further we will uh, further dig that down in a bit. How big were those babies that she had? How long did they go? What type of experience did you have with labor? Was it long and difficult? What type of deliveries? Vaginal, C-section, 
Did you have an epidural or medication? Did you have problems with during that pregnancy that would put her at higher risk during this one? How was the baby? Any complications with the baby? Any birth defects? Any issues where they had to be in the NICU? Method of feeding, you plan to breast or bottle feed and any special concerns that she might have, delivery plan or whatever. Gestational age is the time from the last menstrual period up to the present, okay? That's the weeks, gestational age in weeks. An infant is the time of birth to one year of age. Viability is the minimum age for a fetus to survive. That used to be 24 weeks, now it's 22. Pre-viable infant is one delivered prior to that 22 weeks, prior to 20, the, the viable 22-week period. A preterm infant is delivered between 22 and 37.8. Full term is 38 weeks. So 37.6 is a day before full term. So that's still your preterm, anything before 38 weeks, okay? On your calculation sheet, I may have made this one be 20. We're going to talk about that when we talk about your homework. Do not fuss. Do not worry. It gets very complicated. Different books are going to tell you different things. Uh, that is one area that is not yet uh, in agreement all across the board. So I don't want you to get all muddled about that. Just know that 22 weeks is the earliest they've actually had a baby survive, but I think they're going down to 20 weeks for pre-viable. Um, first trimester is up to 12 weeks, second trimester 12 to 28 weeks of gestation, and then third trimester is 28 to, to wait weeks to delivery, which is 38 to 40 or whenever. Okay. The gravita and parity. This is, I'm sure, confusing, so I'm going to do my best to, to unconfuse it for you. These two, think of them as uterine events. Uterine experiences, uterus, does not matter how many children came out of there, it's a uterine event. The gravity is the number of times that uterus has been pregnant. I don't care if there's one baby in there or 12. If it was pregnant one time, it's a one-time G, okay, G1. Parity is the number of pregnancies with a birth beyond that 22 weeks or the number of times the uterus has emptied a pregnancy after 22 weeks. If you think of it as that uterine experience, it will make more sense. So parity is reflects how many times has the uterus gotten emptied out. So if someone comes in for, for the first prenatal visit, let's say it's her fourth pregnancy. So she's a G4. She's Her uterus has had, this is the fourth time her uterus has gotten pregnant. Her parity cannot be four because the uterus is not emptied this fourth when it's carrying it. So the parity would be a three of some sort, okay? If it's past 22 weeks. That's the if. So gravita four, para three means she's been pregnant four times and three of them got beyond that 22 weeks, okay? What you see down here our babies, this is when the babies get counted. This is the number of children, okay? It doesn't matter what the uterus did. Full-term babies, how many full-term babies came out of that uterus? Full-term for 38 weeks on. If she had one baby, then one baby came out. If she had twins, two babies came out at full-term, okay? So full-term reflects the number of babies that came out of the uterus, whether it was the uterus was pregnant once, twice, three, doesn't matter. Okay, preterm is the number of babies born in that preterm period of time. Twins, if there's a two, could be triplets. It could be one, whatever. It's the number of babies. Abortion slash miscarriage is the number of pre-viable before 22 weeks that delivered. Okay number of pregnancies that delivered prior to 22 weeks. Pregnancy losses after, oops, I'm doing really bad here. Pregnancies losses after the 22nd week are called preterm deliveries. They belong up here. But prior to 22 weeks, that would be considered in medical terminology an abortion. Living is the number of living children. The reason that goes up is because the way my mouse is over there. I'm gonna fix that, I guess. So that's the number of children. So let's pretend 
she's been pregnant six times. She's a G6. Parity, she's had four children, four pregnant, four uterine, four times the uterus has expelled something. So we know something got lost, right? Because six times pregnant, four times, so one of them must have miscarried before the abortion, or before that 22nd week. It didn't get counted because it's before the 22 weeks, okay? So then of these four children, so we know that the A on her is going to be a one. Let me change my color. I'm having too much fun with my writing. So the A on this, we know it's going to be a one because she lost one, right? She lost whatever that one is that got lost there. Preterm, we'd have to talk to her. Were your children born? How many children do you have? I have, you know, five kids. Oh, five. But she's only delivered four pregnancy stuff. So one of them must be twins, right? Because the pregnancy, the uterus is only pregnant four times. She's got five kids. So two of them are twins and they were born preterm. Okay, you got a two there because you were two of your babies were born early. How about the other two? Well, they were full term. Okay, so we got two there. All right. So two, four, and five. Does that make sense? Yes, because she's been pregnant six times. We've accounted for five pregnancies. And how many children does she actually have? Two and two. So the number of living children, if both twins survived, is four. Now, if she had two preterm births, but then one baby died afterwards, this would be a three. Okay? This would still be a two because she delivered two babies. But if one died, that gets reflected down here as a three. I know that's very confusing, but when you're looking at a piece of paper, if you're taking a test, just really think of it. Gravita parity as the uterus. F pal, full term, preterm, abortion, miscarriage, living is all about the number of actual children. Okay? Okay. Hopefully you got that. And I'll be looking at your homework, hopefully before next week, because right now I'm working on all these slides. A primic gravida, primus first, gravida, pregnant uterus, is a woman who's pregnant for the first time. Secunda gravida, I've never used that term, but it would be someone who's pregnant for the second time. Basically, we go from primip to maltip. We just skip the secunda. Maltip, a woman who's been pregnant more than once, is really how we use it in realistic terms. If you see this on a test, though, that's what it means. I'm not going to put it on my test, but if you see it on NCLEX or whatever, that's what that means. A nullip is a woman who's never delivered a child that reaches viability, which I have to change that to be 22 weeks. So a nullip, she delivered at 19 weeks. She's still a nullip. Null, no, no paras, okay? Prima para is someone who has delivered one pregnancy in which the child did reach viability whether the child is born or alive or dead. Basically, 22 weeks or above, she's delivered, she's a primip now. Maltip, someone who's had two or more pregnancies that reach viability. Those are just terminologies. So to summarize that, your gravida and para are uterus. The FPAL are children, actual babies. The initial visit, um, we want to get the menstrual, a really good menstrual history. What do we estimate the due date based on the first day of the last normal period? Part of your homework was to calculate due dates. And I had someone question me about the year and such, but really what you need to do, don't create your own, don't try to create your own um, rule. Okay, Nagel did a rule, we just do his rule, right? Just learn his rule. First day of your last period, let's say uh, was you take the first day of the last period, so go back three months, add seven days, that's going to be the due date, okay? Go back three, up seven. It's really how I think of it. Go back three, up seven. So for LMP was June 30th. Three months back is going to be March, right? And we keep the 30th there. Then we have to go ahead seven days from that 30. Now, this is going to require you to know which months have 30 days which ones have 31 days i know you all know which one has 28 and 29 only but you have to come up with a method for you to learn to remember which ones have 30 and which ones have 31. there is a method using your knuckles 
which we can show you when um, we're together next week. Uh, and then my, my personal method is a little verse I was taught. It's um, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except the second month alone. And that's how I remember it. So whatever it takes, you have to know that. Just trust me. You have to know how many days are in each month. Okay, you have to know that. Don't tell me you didn't get told you have to know that. Okay. So if we have March 30th as the going back, and now we got to add seven days to that. How many days are in the month of March? Let me see. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest, oh, it has 31. So I'm going to count that as day one. And then into April, two, three, four, five, six, seven is going to be April 6th. All right, 31 is the one day, and then six more days makes my seven days to be April 6th is the due date. Now that year, just use your common sense. She got pregnant in June of 2005. Make sure you pay attention that the year doesn't also say 2005, because you can't get pregnant in June and deliver in April the same year. <laughs> it's just impossible. So just step back and go, wait a minute, do I have to change the year? Yeah, I do. Okay. Just use your common sense on that one. All right, so I'll be, I will be looking at your homework to see if anybody needs help with that. Hopefully you got it all figured out. Contraceptive history, medical surgical history. I'm not going to read through these because I referred to them earlier. The initial visit, the woman and her partner, who is her partner. Uh, we have all kinds of new types of partners nowadays, so you have to kind of know what's going on. Um, what are the genetic issues in the family tree? If it's not her, you know, if this is a female too, we got to know, do they know much about the dad, all that stuff. Drug and alcohol abuse may affect, affect their ability to cope with life. Someone who's a drug abuser will have a higher, a lower pain tolerance and require, uh, and think they're in pain, you know, their back aches worse than anybody else's back ache because they're not used to feeling anything. So, uh, it helps to know that information. If the mom is Rh negative, it's ideal if we can get the father of the baby's blood type because if he is also Rh negative, then we know the baby's going to be negative and there's no worry. But a lot of times dads aren't there for testing or they don't cooperate or they're just not there. Period. And so we treat the mom as if she is, if, as if the baby is Rh positive. They get tested and they'll get Rogam. Um, and then at, during pregnancy, if they have any type of intrauterine access, like amniocentesis, anything that can cause a potential for um, blood transference, they will get Rogam to prevent um, RH isoimmunization. After birth, the baby gets tested. If the baby is negative, mom does not need another Rogam. But if the baby is positive, then the mom needs a Rogam to prevent concerns for the next pregnancy. And of course, that psychosocial history we've mentioned, and we will talk about that on different slides. But did they want to get pregnant? Is they going to keep the baby if they weren't planning on getting pregnant? Who's the family? Who's the support system, etc.? Vital signs, this is all up to us. Blood pressure, pulse, temperature, respiration, checking for venous congestion, edema, all the things we talked about that affect the system. We've got to look at all of that. Now, fundal height is done by the provider. Clinical pelvimetry, you would never do. Um, you may or may not be the one doing the fetal heart rate, but just know why you're doing all those things that you are doing or why the provider is doing them, okay? Pay attention for pallor. Do they look anemic? Um, are they uh, jaundiced at all? How the cloasma, linea negra, you can't fix it, but is it bothering the patient? That's normal, but does it bother her? Um, ask about bleeding gums if anything's a problem there because we want to make sure they're using that soft toothbrush we want to talk about ways to prevent constipation that urine we always do a dipstick urine we're looking for protein and if there's a little glucose we know that's normal if they're not gaining weight pay attention to those ketones um the breasts uh, again this is this is all most of this would be by the provider but this is what they're going to be looking for okay by manual is where the provider puts their fingers inside the vagina and they actually feel the uterus 
one hand's on the abdomen, the other's inside to feel the uterus between the two, the two hands, the fingers of both hands, and we can tell how big that uterus is when it's a, still early. Labs, that RH factor and antibody screen, uh, which we mentioned. These are the blood tests uh, that I said there's just a list of. Just You don't have to memorize all these, but just know what's important is you know, we're going to be checking for iron, for iron problems. We want to check for this, the uh, STDs to make sure there's not a concern transmitting to the baby. Rubella titer. Some women have not had or they've lost their immunity to German measles. TB test is pretty, uh, pretty much, that's done most of the time. Hepatitis B, have they ever had the vaccines for that? Um, how about HIV? Uh, of course, the UA, PAP test, cervical cultures. We'll talk about these um, when we talk about other screenings. Don't worry about that. Um, th so that's your initial assessment. After that, when they come in every week or then every two weeks and then every week, it's just basically very, very, very um, focused to vital signs, their height, I'm not their height, their height doesn't change, their weight, your analysis, fundal height, fetal heart rate, fetal activity, and signs of labor. Um, and this is the, the pattern of visits monthly until 28 weeks, every two weeks from 28 to 36 weeks, and then 36 to delivery weekly. If they go 40 weeks or beyond, they probably will be coming in twice a week because that placenta gets old after 40 weeks, and we don't want to lose a baby because the placenta got old and didn't do its job. So we do bi-weekly testing. Additionally, Ultrasounds will be done. This is going to be covered more in our screening, so you don't have to get too detailed with it now, but ultrasounds will be done. Quad screen, which is a blood test in the mom. The glucose screen, which I mentioned, 26, 24 to 28 weeks. That RHI immunization, pelvic exam, and Leopold's maneuvers, which Leopold's is just feeling the position of the baby in mom's abdomen. More than one baby in there, they're diagnosed by ultrasound. Generally, you'll get suspicious when that fundal height is four centimeters greater than just one baby. Um, we've talked about all this. I am not going to repeat that um, If with, because everything just gets worse with more than one baby. You get even more blood, even more fatigue, even more, more, more. So the effect is greater when there's twins or can you imagine more? Um, prenatal care, you'll, they'll be coming in more often because of the higher risk. The common discomforts, the main reason to know these is so that you'll know how to counsel your patient to, um, to deal with them. But there's morning sickness and then there's hyperemesis gravidarum, which I am not going to go into. We just can't, but that's just vomiting so much they lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. Um, and it might be related to the, it is related to hormones, but they're not real sure why one a lot of, I've actually heard it's, they're allergic to one husband. They won't have the problem with another husband. So I don't know. They don't really know, but it's, it's bad. Um, they can lose a lot of weight. Heartburn, what's causing that? How can they prevent it? Your backache, why does that happen? Round ligament pain is an interesting um, phenomenon. You take that pregnant uterus again, okay? And when it's little, I mean, it's always held in place by these ligaments. This is just holding it in the pelvic cavity there. But as the uterus grows and stretches, those ligaments get really long. Okay. And that's process of growing from this, trying to do real life, about that long to this long is very painful. So just letting them know what that is, because they always think I'm miscarrying because I have pain in my side. No, you have brown ligament pain. So teach them about that. The only thing you can do for it is to Bend over, double over, try to loosen, the, make it a little, not as long for a second and give it relaxed and then, and warm baths help. So then urinary frequency, teaching them the difference between normal and UTI. Some exercises they can do to help relieve some of these symptoms. Uh, we've talked about the varicosities, hemorrhoids, constipation, leg cramps. Um, you know, this is just of course I care, I just don't want to hear about your hemorrhoids right now. I mean, it discomforts of pregnancy. You know, we are just these mucoid-filled, constipated, can't move, and yet we're legs falling apart creatures. What can I say? Danger signs that you need to teach your patient and you need to be aware of is their vaginal bleeding with or without discomfort. Um, there are reasons that will hurt and there are reasons that it's what we call quiet bleeding. It just happens. There's That's a problem. 
They think their water broke. They need to know to call us. Swelling of their fingers or puffiness of the face and eyes. That's different than the feet. Remember, dependent edema is not a problem. It's when it hits your fingers or your eyes. We got to worry. Continuous pounding headache. These are and visual disturbances. These are signs of the preeclampsia turning into a bad thing. So we'll talk about those later. So we want to ask about those. Persistent or severe abdominal pain can have various causes. Some can be normal. Some can be problematic. Chills or fever, of course, would be infection. The urination problems. Persistent vomiting. We worry about nutrition um, primarily, but we just want to get them feeling better. And then if the baby was moving really good and then all of this today it's just not moving as well, they need to know that it's perfectly fine to call us, come on in. If we're not, if the office is closed, we'll send him into the hospital. We want to know if that baby is slowed down, we got to find out, make sure he's okay in there. Um, here's a question to Mary. She asked if she can go in her sister's hot tub when she visits the next weekend. Um, what would you tell her? What are you going to tell someone who wants to go into a hot tub? Another gal, Vivian, has chronic nasal congestion since she's been pregnant. You tell her it's due to what and what can she do for relief? If we remember, we will talk about those next Friday. <laughs> Remind me. Um, Larissa thinks she might have a UTI. She keeps get, having to get up to go to the bathroom during the night. Isn't able to hold as much urine as usual. Is she right to be worried? What do you tell her? Okay. Um, and here's the precious baby in the little lotus flower blossom, but it's so pretty. Anyway, this is the end of our slides. Um, we've gotten through this. I don't know the time. It's got 48 minutes here, but I'm going to end now and see if I can post these. Hopefully I can. And you guys, I hope this has helped and get ready for the next set tomorrow.